right, everybody, welcome back to the Bible Study Podcast. I'm Travis Polly, and here we have one goal, learn to love like Jesus. And I'm here, as always, with Wes McAdams. Hi, Wes. Hi, Travis. How are you doing? I'm doing great. We're in my office. We're in your office. We're on a mobile setup today. Usually we're in your office in the yep. studio, but now, because of all the construction... That's right. With all the construction, we mentioned it a couple times, we've got some construction going on, but we shouldn't hear any of that here today. We'll so, have totally new noises on this side right. of the building. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so today we have a topic, stoicism, stoicism, which I'm very excited to talk about. Yeah. I'm not stoic at all about how excited I am to talk <laughs> about this today. Yeah, I'm excited too. I, I, I felt and feel very out of my element in discussing this. Um, and I think that I think that's a good place to start, actually. Just the idea that there are other philosophies, there are other ideas, there are other ways of thinking, different narratives, different frameworks uh, that have existed. Obviously, Stoicism has been around for a very long time. Um, even the Book of Acts mentions the Stoics and the Epicureans. And so these philosophies have existed for a very long time, and now we're sort of making a comeback. And as things come up, um, we're, we, we constantly have the need to compare what these narratives, what these philosophies are saying and promoting and the assumptions that they're making and compare those with the narrative of Scripture, with the narrative of the gospel, because the gospel is a narrative. The gospel is a story right. that tells us who we are, uh, what's going on, and where are we headed. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of these other philosophies um, have a narrative that is either directly, explicitly stated or is implied within the philosophy that says, this is who we are, this is what's happening, and this is where we're headed. And so we have to examine these narratives against one another, and we're never going to be, as followers of Jesus who embrace our narrative, we're probably not going to be experts in these other narratives, and that's okay. But we can appreciate the things about them that are true, while also critiquing the things that are not true, are not in keeping with the narrative of the gospel. Um, and and I got an email from a listener uh, named Ryan Day, and Ryan has been listening for a long time, and he has very patiently waited for me to respond uh, to this question. This question, I think he first submitted to me back in 2000, April 11th, 2018. So oh, wow. I apologize, Ryan. It has been a very long time, three years since uh, since he first emailed me. And then a few weeks ago, he emailed me again and said, hey, have you given this any more thought? And so I said, oh, you know what? I need to do that. Uh, but he, he talks about the rise in Stoicism in neo-Stoicism, what some would refer to it as. Mm -hmm. Uh, He mentioned several, quote-unquote, new Stoics, uh, guys that are bloggers and authors, YouTubers, a couple guys I'll mention by name, even though I I briefly read some of their stuff or watched some of their videos, but I'm certainly not an expert on these guys, and I'm not holding them up as as experts in their field, because I don't know. Uh, But Ryan Holiday is one name that he mentioned, and John Sonmez, maybe? John Mm. Sonmez? Um, Bulldog Mindset, I think, is his YouTube channel. I don't mm-hmm. recommend that because of the um, lots of lots of reasons. We may touch mm-hmm. on that in a little bit. Um, uh, the profanity and the, the explicit nature of, of some of what he's putting out there, uh, which kind of prompted Ryan's question was, is the fact that some of these um, names within Stoicism or these people that are promoting Stoicism as a philosophy, as a way of life, um, does their profanity, does their um, toxicity, whatever you want to call it, does it reflect on something broken within Stoicism itself? Mm. Um, and so his big question is, can Christians embrace Stoicism, or is Stoicism contrary to the gospel? And I think that's a great a great question. Yeah. And I think, first of all, we have to we have to define Stoicism, mm-hmm. and I don't even know that I'm an expert enough to do that. And so as I go through all of this, if somebody out there is more of an expert in Stoicism, don't hesitate. I'm sure people won't. I, I never have to tell people, don't hesitate to correct me, because they'll correct me whether I want them to or not. But, uh, but certainly, feel free to, to tell me where I'm, I'm getting Stoicism wrong. But I don't want to misrepresent this philosophy, either from the ancient perspective or from the modern perspective, as those two may or may not be similar. But even before we get into it, you already mentioned a second ago 
I'm not being stoic in my excitement about <laughs> stoicism. So, so we tend to, we tend to think stoic to be stoic is simply, what would you say? Like, what would you say, Travis is? Yeah. Kind of a, like my layman's understanding of it is not getting overly emotional about mm. things, not overreacting yeah. either positively or negatively. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I think, I think the second one probably is more in keeping with what they would say about themselves, what mm-hmm. a Stoic would say, not overreacting. I think that's a good way to put it. Right. But I don't necessarily think that they would say that it's n- not being emotional. Right. Um, but but at the same time, I, I think there's, there's some of those um, categorizations or assumptions mm-hmm. or generalizations about Stoicism, even if they wouldn't necessarily agree with it, might be fitting to some degree. But anyway, let me read through. This is These are quotes from Epictetus, um, who was a Stoic, an ancient Stoic. And um, and, and here's some, some quotes that I think will kind of help us to get some, some nuance and some understanding of where Stoic philosophy is coming from. So he says things like this, Don't ask for things to happen as you would like them to but wish them to happen as they actually do, and you will be all right. And we could Mm -hmm. stop and talk about any one of these for (laughs) a long time. Let me say that again. Don't ask for things to happen as you would like them to, but wish them to happen as they actually do, and you will be all right. In other words, if, if something happens that you weren't necessarily wanting to happen or wishing to happen, just say, well, I, I wanted this to happen anyway. This realign your expectations according to what happens and and don't expect things to happen in a certain way. Mm. Expect them to happen the way they actually do happen. And then, then you won't be disappointed because then they, they, you're, you're, you're getting what you wanted because what you wanted was this all along. Even right. if you didn't know that's what you wanted, that's what you wanted. Yeah. Um, if I can get it and preserve my honor and integrity and moral principles, show me the way and I will get it. Or number three, if someone in the street were entrusted with your body, you would be furious. Yet you entrust your mind to anyone around you who happens to insult you and allow it to be troubled and confused. Hmm. There's a lot of interesting thought in there. Like you wouldn't entrust your body to someone on the street. But when you allow someone's criticism of you to to confuse you or trouble you, then you are allowing them to have control of your mind. And so the whole point being, don't give control of your inner self to other people. You control what's going on inside of you. Don't give that control to other people. Draw up right now a definite character and identify for yourself one that you intend to stick to, whether you are by yourself or in company. So decide who you're going to be. When you have accustomed your body to a frugal regime, don't put on airs about it. And if you only drink water, don't broadcast the fact all the time. I think the person who shared these quotes, it was helping us to see some of the similarities between what Jesus said about when you're mm-hmm. fasting, don't don't tell everybody you're fasting. The signs of a person making progress are these, criticizing nobody, praising nobody, blaming nobody, accusing nobody, and saying nothing about oneself to indicate being someone or knowing something. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say that one more time. The signs of a person making progress are these, criticizing nobody, praising nobody, blaming nobody, accusing nobody, and saying nothing about oneself to indicate being someone or knowing something. Hmm. Um, so again, these are from Epictetus, just to help us to get some of the the various ideas. Of course, Stoicism is huge, and, and the, right. the writings are on it are extensive, both in ancient uh, Greece and today. And so trying to wrap our minds around it or summarize it is going to be difficult. But uh, I would say something like this, that Stoicism accepts external situations as they are. Mm. And it's the effort to try not to try <laughs> to control external situations, mm. to to do your best to not try to control what happens outside of you because you don't have any control over that. So accept whatever it is that happens. Whatever happens outside of you, accept it, Mm. because that is the way that it is, and you you have no control over it anyway. Uh, But try to strictly control your internal issues. Whatever internal things come up, 
then control the internal self so as to grow in virtue and live in harmony with nature. Uh, from what I've read, um, those are the goals. The goals are to be a virtuous person and to live in harmony with nature. And that's one of the distinctions between like the Stoics and the Epicureans. The Epicureans would say, well, life is about avoiding pain and experiencing mm. pleasure. Right. And the, the, Sto the Epicureans would say life is about avoiding pain and experiencing pleasure, while the Stoics would say life is about, or the goal of life, the telos of life is to be virtuous and to live in harmony with nature. Um, so I think where I want to start is by lauding the positive as aspects of Stoicism. And yeah. I think it's pretty obvious that there are many uh, positive aspects of Stoicism. Um, and I think that it's almost always true that that whatever the philosophy is, that there are very few philosophies that someone might come up with that have no redeeming qualities. I think sure. almost every philosophy, almost yeah. every worldview or narrative has some redeeming quality, even Epicureanism, right. <laughs> even the idea of avoiding pain and experiencing pleasure. Ni like Nihilism might be the only one I can think of offhand. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, th yeah, there's going to be some that are bad. very, that are difficult to find some redeeming yeah. qualities and others that, that uh, certainly have redeeming qualities. And mm -hmm. a lot of times the reason we think that a philosophy doesn't have redeeming qualities is because we don't really understand it. Sure. And, and I think if we understand where someone else is coming from, and this kind of goes across the board outside of just what we're talking about right now, like if we understand what someone who's an unbeliever believes and why they do what they do if we really understood them then we could we could find some points of agreement and mm -hmm. we could say you know what i i see where you're coming from on yeah. this even if i don't embrace your worldview even if i don't embrace your narrative i see where you're coming from and there's so much value to that there's so much value to finding those places of common ground um, in fact one of the things that theologians talk about and we've probably talked about it on the podcast before, is common grace. And that's the idea that that all people have been given a common grace, a common bestowing of, of moral rightness, mm -hmm. of, of what's true and what's moral. Everyone has a moral consciousness yeah. to some degree or another uh, to know and to do what's right. Um, and so there will always be overlaps between what an unbeliever thinks is right and true and good and does when they're doing what they believe is right and true and good, there will always be some overlap between that and what Christians believe is right and true and good. Now, there's going to be differences, too, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But there will always be overlap. Uh, and I think Paul talks about this in Romans 2, verses 14 through 16, and he's talking— He's trying to bridge the gap between Jews and Gentiles and help them to understand that everybody needs God's grace. Everybody needs uh, forgiveness. Everybody's sinned and fallen short. But in order to do that, he says, first, the Gentiles have sinned and fallen short. But then he reminds the Jews that when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature, by nature, do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the works of the law, that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So, Paul says that sometimes people do by nature what the law requires and that they have the work of the law written on their hearts. And so I think that um, the, the Stoics who were not influenced by the law of Moses, they weren't influenced right. by the gospel, they weren't influenced by, uh, by revealed truth, they were simply influenced by the what was written on their hearts, what was written on their mind. And I yeah. think that they came to a lot of good conclusions, which gives credit and glory not to the Stoics, but to God, who built their minds, who built their hearts, who gave them that ability to reason and to think through those things. Yeah. Um, and so I think we could we could list off a lot of things that that the Stoics got right. I think, one, they rightly recognize that there are many things outside of our control, mm -hmm. and it's futile to try to control them. I think there's a, a huge lesson to be learned in that. We spend a lot of our time, a lot of our life frustrated 
that things aren't the way we want them to be, frustrated that things didn't go the way we want them to be. Yeah. Um, and, and it's true, things, things are do get messed up and things don't go the way we want them to. And we can either wring our hands about it and shake our fist at it, or we can move on. And, and so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of truth to a lot of wisdom to the idea that um, the sooner you understand that things aren't going to go the way you want them to sometimes and that you have no control over them, the, the better off you'll be in a lot of ways. And I, I think that there is a, there's a lot of overlap between what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes yeah. about Hevel, everything is Hevel, yeah. and what the Stoics believe. Yeah, you know when that that main idea you you already centered on from uh, from Stoicism that idea of accepting things as they are mm. instead of always wishing and kicking yourself that it's not uh, and kicking against the world and the and life and mm-hmm. that it's that it's not the way you'd like it to be. You know, it made, it made me think of uh, Matthew six thirty four. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for mm. tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day, uh, uh, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Yeah. And this idea of, you know, we talk about, and James tells us to, to talk like this, mm-hmm. if the Lord wills it, yeah. yeah, your will be done. Yeah. You know, this idea that I, I'm always going to have things that I want to do, and mm-hmm. I want to see it work out this way, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, I'm not the creator of the universe, right. and a certain amount, I've, that's something I've tried to add into my life is that idea of your will be done, you know, mm-hmm. Lord willing, mm-hmm. because it does, it just checks you. Like even mm-hmm. saying it, and if you think about what you're saying, it checks you and it goes, you know, nothing sure. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> we, you still have to act. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where, you know, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get into this more, but that's where talking about any philosophy, whether it's stoicism or anything else, I've always felt that there. You know, like you said, there's always going to be good, mm-hmm. almost always going to be mm-hmm. good things you can pull from a philosophy and right. say I, that 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 makes sense to me. That clarifies maybe something in scripture for mm-hmm. me. Like mm-hmm. you said, there's going to be overlap. Um, but I think as a you know, it, I've always thought it weird to think about any philosophy like I'm a Stoic. Mm. Whether uh, mm-hmm. back then, and of course, uh, there's a lot of cultural mm-hmm. misunderstandings I would mm-hmm. have, but especially more today. Like, because philosophy seems to always stop short, you know, it's about, it's sort, it's, it's, it's sort of a how to, mm-hmm. whether it's how to live or how to think or mm-hmm. both. Um, but it all, philosophy always just seems like a piece of theology. Yeah. 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 No, the, you're, you're hitting on some really good stuff. I, I want to come back to that in a second when we talk about the sort of the negative aspects, yeah. but, but yeah, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, secondly, I would say in, in a positive light for Stoicism that it rightly recognizes the danger in allowing our emotional reactions to dictate mm-hmm. our behavior. Um, and I think that that's, that's a good recogni- rec- recognition, recognition. Uh, that's a good recognition to recognize that there is a danger in allowing our emotional reactions to a situation to dictate what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, and Scripture has a lot to say about our sinful desires, mm. that our desires and our passions and our emotions can cloud our, our better judgment and can get in the way of doing what we're supposed to do and being virtuous. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's a lot that a lot that 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 goes against the grain of the culture in which we live today yeah. that says what you feel is who you are mm-hmm. what you feel what you desire what you want your yeah. your passions and desires in the moment um, ought to be fulfilled in a lot of ways we we have the same clash of philosophies even between unbelievers today as as was in the 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 early, the ancient world, you, you have Epicureans who are really just pursuing pleasure. And then you have Stoics who say, no, 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 um, th- there is, there's wisdom in being self-controlled. There is wisdom in being virtuous. There is wisdom in doing the right thing, um, even when it's not what I want to do in the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so again, I mean, there's a lot to applaud there. Uh, number three, Stoicism rightly recognizes the importance of virtue. We've touched on that a, a, a couple of times. Um, we'll, we'll talk about, well, how do you define virtue and and where does your idea of virtue come from? That that's important. Um, but just the idea of virtue we've been for the last few weeks, I've been preaching through second Peter chapter one and, 
And Peter gives, as well as Paul does several times, a, a list of virtues, a list of Christian virtues, like like the um, like like the fruit of the spirit, the the characteristics of the spirit's fruit. And mm. and Peter would say that that you need to grow in these areas. You need to add to your your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge yeah. and to your knowledge self control and self control steadfastness. And he would list these things off as virtues. And and the Greeks would often do the same. The philosophers would do the same. And they would talk about what is virtue? What does it look like to live a virtuous life? Mm. Um, and so it's it's admirable and right uh, that people would look for those things and and philosophize about those things and reason through those things and say, what does it mean to be virtuous? What does it mean to be helpful? What does it mean to be good? Um, how do I live a good life? So even just that, and there's a lot to compliment. There's a lot to applaud um, in the seeking after virtue mm. and trying to live a virtuous life. Yeah, I think in, in you know, the, this idea that I, I, I was, I have the book Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it's one of those books that's on my shelf, and I, I flipped through it but I've never read it. Gotcha. Um, but, you know, he's yeah. one of the most famous yeah, Stoics Yeah, absolutely. Himself. Emperor and, and, yeah, um, and Stoic. And I think, that, you know, that, that was a really... I, I know more about his life than his than his writings, his mm. teachings, and, and his meditations on Stoicism. And um, But it, it was always interesting to me that a, a, the, at that time, the most powerful person in the world is subscribing to this philosophy mm-hmm. that... You know, even just touching on it, studying history as a kid, that was, you know, you could see a lot of similarities between that and, yeah. and our faith and right. our Christianity. But I, I'm interested what you think about how how do you think? And I, I, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, maybe maybe we're building to this, but how do you incorporate? Because I feel like there's a how do you incorporate the good things about a philosophy? Because you mm. know, like I brought up before, it's like. I think there's always a temptation to like wear the title um, and maybe more so back then than today. But I think how, how are we supposed to approach that as Christians? Cause I, I've, I've heard good and bad things people say about like, or th- things I agree with and things I, I, I struggle with when people talk about looking at other philosophies mm-hmm. and looking at other, uh, belief systems and yeah. how much as Christians are we supposed to? What are, what are we supposed to do with that? Yeah, all that. I mean, that's a fantastic question. I think I think for the most part, we need to be very very careful. We need to be incredibly guarded about adopting philosophies that we feel like are not in contradiction to the gospel or might supplement ugh, see yeah. even just that idea well, you brought up the the pete the uh the peter passage that you've been preaching on yes supplement your faith yes yeah 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 so so here are the things that we're supposed to add to our faith mm. uh here are what we're supposed to build onto our faith um you, you don't see add to your faith philosophy mm. <laughs> add to your faith human wisdom um, that's where we get in trouble. And that's where that's the, the whole book of Colossians is all about that. It's all about thinking that the gospel is lacking in some way, that it's lacking some truth. It's lacking some wisdom. It's lacking some philosophy and that we need to supplement the gospel with some human philosophy. That's where I think we have to be incredibly guarded. And, and I have to say, I have everything I need in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have everything that I need in Christ, that in Christ is all of the wisdom, is yeah. all of God dwells in him. All of knowledge and wisdom and truth dwells in Jesus, period. Where I think it is good for us to acknowledge the the truth in other philosophies is to build a bridge, is to say, oh, you also recognize the importance of virtue, here, let me let me share with you what I believe about virtue. Let me share with you what Jesus reveals about virtue. Let me let me use that as a common ground from which to to jump off and and to help bring that person to Jesus, um, or, or even finding points of commonality to build friendships and to build relationships. Right. But if we're if we're doing it like 
well, you know, Christianity is good and, and I like it, but, you know, I'm going to fill in some of the holes or fill in some of the blanks with this other stuff. That's where I think we really get into trouble. And I, I think that even in pointing out these these positive things, um, we run the risk of saying, oh, so there, there's some philosophy over here we can adopt. It's like, no, um, I don't want us to necessarily adopt this, but I do want to appreciate where where there's similarities. And again, I think there's a huge difference between adopting and appreciating. There's a difference between appreciating where someone else is right and true and good and honorable and where we ought to compliment them and then adopting their philosophy. Because as you said, um, to adopt this as your philosophy is to adopt this as your identity, is to say, I yeah. am a Stoic. Well, no, I'm not. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. There happens to be some overlap between Stoicism and what we believe as Christians, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that I'm partially a Stoic or that I, I'm going to borrow some Stoicism to right. add it to Christianity. We believe that all truth and all knowledge and all real wisdom is found in Jesus, and that other philosophies have also recognized, also picked up on some wisdom that is evident in the world, that is naturally discerned. So that's kind of reminiscent of Paul of preaching in Athens. Absolutely, yeah. About, you know, he's, he's recognizing, you know, you have, an, un, you're, you have a, an idol to an unknown God here, and that's laudable because it means you're searching. It means, yes. you know, it's, it's finding, like you said, finding the common ground. And, and Paul would do that a lot. He would quote from their philosophers. He would quote from their uh, their poets. He would quote from their idols and to say, uh, here, here's a similarity. We can start here and build our way to Jesus. I just want to take a short break from our Bible study to tell you that if you are enjoying this discussion, you might also enjoy my book, Beyond the Verse. You can find the audio version of the book at radicallychristian.com slash audible. That's radicallychristian.com slash audible. And if you're not already an Audible subscriber, you can actually get my book for free when you sign up for a free trial. So go to radicallychristian.com slash audible. And now back to the Bible study. Okay, so we've talked about some of the positive aspects of Stoicism, and I think there could be there could be more. I didn't yeah. mention that. Um, th- just that there seems to be a very a very positive. It's almost like to me what I've read on Stoicism puts a positive spin on things, um, and, and I, I hate to criticize um, those philosophies or those ideas that help people to be more positive and more productive right. and to to get over some of the negative things in their life and to, to move past those things and do good things and to be positive and optimistic. I, I mean, so I hate to criticize that. Um, so I wanted to start with the positive, the, the encouragement, but I, I do think we have to point out the negatives. We have to point out um, the the, the foundation, the assumptions that are being made that, that need to be, um, from a Christian perspective, uh, need to be pointed out so that we are very careful about different philosophies in the world. Um, so uh, one of the things I think that's important to point out is that we need to not think more highly of our own reason mm-hmm. than we should. Um, all philosophy, this is where all philosophy falls short, because all philosophy relies on human wisdom, on human reasoning. That idea of logic and reasoning, philosophy, philosophy itself, the whole idea of being a philosopher, the whole idea of of being someone who bases your life on human reasoning is problematic, mm. because there's an assumption there that ultimate truth can be discerned naturally. Right. And, and that's where all philosophy falls short. That's the difference between philosophy and theology. That's the difference between philosophy and Christianity, is that Christianity believes that not all truth can be naturally discerned. That there is some—so we would agree that some truth can be naturally discerned. There is common grace. Mm-hmm. But we would disagree that ultimate truth can be naturally discerned, that that— all truth can be naturally discerned. So even questions like what is good, what is virtuous, the Epicureans would say, well, good is what feels good, what's pleasurable. Bad is what feels bad, what's painful. Um, Christianity, by the way, would acknowledge some of that, would affirm some of what the Epicureans would say. Yes, 
evil is pain. Pain is evil. That's mm-hmm. bad. We don't want pain. We don't want evil. Um, the the, uh, the Platonists would say certain things. The, the Stoics would say certain things. But they're all using their own reason and logic to, to rethink, okay, was this true? I feel this way, but do I feel this way because it's true? Or do I feel this way because uh, it's an illusion? What's, what's an illusion and what's reality? And they would use their own reasoning and logic to try to figure out what's real and what's illusion. We still do that. We still struggle with that. Every human being takes it upon themselves to try to reason through what is real. Even if we reason so far as to say, I think Therefore, I am. I know I exist because I'm thinking right now. So that's the only reason I know that I exist, because how do I know I'm not an illusion? So we, we all are relying on our own thinking and reasoning to figure out what's true and what's, what's not true. Mm-hmm. But what the gospel says is actually you cannot discern all truth or ultimate truth through simply your own discernment. It's not all naturally discovered. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 when he really he differentiates between the gospel and philosophy. And, and this is a great passage to say, why can't a Christian be a Stoic? Mm-hmm. <laughs> why can't a Christian be an Epicurean? Why can't a Christian be a Platonist? Why can't a Christian be a whatever? Fill in the blank. Because our truth, the truth by which we live our lives, is not naturally discerned. So this is from 1 Corinthians 1, starting in verse 18. Paul says, For the word of the cross— is folly, it's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom— you cannot know God through wisdom, through yeah. worldly wisdom. And, and I think that's, that's where all philosophy, and there's a lot of people in our world today that are, that are watching and listening to and subscribing to, adopting the worldview and perspective of various philosophers, YouTube philosophers. You know, so in the old days, they would go to Mars Hill, they would go to Athens, and they would sit around and they would talk about various philosophies. Today, we go to the the Areopagus of YouTube, <laughs> and we sit and we listen at the feet of all of these philosophers. And, and we sometimes forget that the world cannot and does not know God through wisdom, and that the wisdom of God thwarts the wisdom of the world. And and so we have to recognize that while these YouTube philosophers or these blogging philosophers or these authors that that put out books upon books upon books, while they might be right about some things, they are also going to be wrong about some things, and that yeah. ultimate truth cannot be discerned naturally. Well, and you know, something I've thought about lately, because I, I, you know, I'm a big YouTube guy. Sure. And- um, and I, I, you know, you and I were talking before we did this about, you know, my, my love for Jordan Peterson and, um, and even that, like, you know, that's something I've, I study a lot of their work, of his work and, mm-hmm. and other people as well. And, um, but I, I've even had reminders lately that, you know, I think if you're, if you're trying to follow Christ, that's your number one goal. Sure. And you also want to take in, you know, other influences that, mm-hmm call out to you the you know that they call out christ from you you Mm -hmm. know that makes you want to be a better christian sure you go well maybe if i follow this and try some of these things it'll help me and you know if it's any good you you know if there's any good in it like we're talking about stoicism then you you know you notice you're a little bit better things get a little bit better you're treating people a little bit better and then you know i've had reminders recently that you know a lot of philosophies complex as they are, one of the things that makes them distinct is that they're consistent. You know, Mm -hmm. that's something I've always thought about. I I would even say consistency is probably a stoic trait. Yeah. um, Specifically to this, to this philosophy that it's consistent. And the problem is, you know, we've talked about on the podcast some, and, and you and I have had personal conversations talking about this too, that 
the Bible is so full of paradoxes. Yes, yes. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. So consistency is great. Yeah. But I think that, again, if you're trying to follow Jesus and that's your number one goal, and you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cringe like you did, supplement yeah. that faith with, I'm going to try this way, I'm going to try using the, the, the methods of this philosopher or this yeah. philosophy. God will show you when you've taken it too far. Yeah. Like I, I, again, if you're trying to follow, if you're Jesus, willing, yeah, yeah. yeah if, you're, if you're willing, if you're willing to, see, to see, and I've had some moments recently where I went, okay, maybe I took that, you know, that way of ordering my life, I took it too far. Yeah. God humbled me. Yeah. You know, and and it doesn't make it the philosophy null and void, but it's like it's it's a reminder that that's good. And also maybe some maybe this is good. Yeah. Like and, and again that that idea of a paradox that it's like consistency's great, but life is complex. Yeah. And you know ag- again not to straw man stoicism at all or anything else for that matter, but you know the idea of not letting you, you know not letting your passions overwhelm you. It's mm-hmm. like you know I I would say that might actually be a decent time to bring up like you know well Jesus. N- not a stoic. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. You know, and he did not even from an. I'm, I'm not going to use the, the 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 whips in the temple as a, as a example of. Oh, that means we can get angry and passionate. Yeah. But just in terms of. Yeah. Oh, he had his moments. Yeah. Of reacting appropriately. Yeah. And well, and even you know. even beyond that, even even the idea that he, Jesus totally abandoned the idea of temperance and all things, moderation and all things, right. like that idea that you should always be moderate. That that Jesus wouldn't wouldn't affirm that at all. Mm-hmm. That idea that That's we should we should take sort of a middle middle of the road approach. I mean, and and I love what you're saying about about the paradoxes. I mean, because that's what human philosophy relies on logic and reasoning. And if they can't see the logic and reasoning, and I, I, I hear people that they try to interpret scripture through the lens of their own human reasoning. And so they say, well, if this doesn't sound reasonable to me, if this doesn't sound logical, if this doesn't sound consistent, right. then I need to throw it out. So I'm, I'm misinterpreting something. It's like, well, how do you know that two things that seem, that, that mm. seem irreconcilable, that seem illogical are not both true? And, and, and this is exactly what Paul's talking about in context, as he's talking about the cross, how can you say that Jesus, that Jesus claimed a military victory, a military-like victory over the forces of evil and darkness through dying? That's right. ridiculous. Right. That's illogical. That's not reasonable. It's not logical. It's not wise to say such a thing. It's foolish to say such a thing. And Paul says, yes. And that is the wisdom of God triumphing over the wisdom of human beings. So I'm going to read I'm going to read the the rest of this. He says, "For since in the wisdom of God the world did not go, know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach." See Paul is calling the cross folly, foolishness, hmm. of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God, (laughs) the foolishness of God, he says tongue-in-cheek, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And so that is the gospel. The gospel is the cross of Jesus that is a stumbling block to the Jews and it is foolishness to the Greeks. But if we believe it, it is the power of God to salvation. He'll go on in the second chapter, 1 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 12. He says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person, and again, this is every philosopher, every person who thinks, who has as their base assumption that through reasoning and logic, I can get to the bottom of everything. That's the natural person. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to them, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And I think about the the Sermon on the Mount. I think about so many things that Jesus taught that no matter what philosopher it is, you, you could have a philosopher that's more 
Epicurean or more Stoic or more whatever, there, there's going to be part of that that they say, oh, yes, yeah, I totally agree with what Jesus is saying there. And part of it, they're saying, no, no, why, yeah. why would anybody live this way? That, that doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. Uh, and Paul says, it's because this is not natural truth. Mm-hmm. And the natural person isn't even able to understand these things. It, they have to be spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. And so Paul is saying this truth, this life-saving truth, this truth that will set you free, this truth about the kingdom of God and what Jesus has done, it cannot be naturally discerned. You can't just sit there as a philosopher and reason through and say, oh, yes, that all that all makes perfect sense. Of course, it's all very logical. No, you will never get to the bottom of it. You will never discover it. And philosophy, where philosophy goes wrong, is it believes that the truth, and this is all Eastern religion, Eastern mysticism, uh, New Age religion, um, all, all philosophies, they all all are looking inward for truth, all thinking that if I look inward enough, if I, if I, as they say, if I study my own belly button enough, you know, if I look Mm -hmm. inward enough, then I will discover the truth and I'll figure things out. And, and Paul would say, no, the truth isn't found in you. You don't look inward. You look upward that the, the truth, the ultimate truth, the ultimate wisdom, the ultimate knowledge is revealed through the spirit. And he says, we're giving that to you, not because we're philosophers, not because all of this makes perfect logical sense, right. but because it has been given to us through the Spirit, and now we're giving it to you. And if you are spiritual people, you'll accept it. And if you're carnal people, natural people, you're just relying on your own wisdom and logic, you'll reject it because you'll say that doesn't make any sense. That's foolish. Right. You know, this idea of paradoxes in the Bible, it occurred to me as you were talking that what that requires of us is, and what I've noticed in myself looking at seemingly contradictory callings in scripture of Christians is it it requires faith. Mm. And I don't, and I don't mean like faith as in a blind faith, like, well, that doesn't make any sense to me, but okay. Right. Faith that it can make sense to you. Faith that you're capable of that. Mm -hmm. And I, I keep thinking of this idea that, you know, we're told in scriptures that we're image bearers of God. Mm-hmm. And I got to, you know, we've done it before. I got to plug the chosen again because <laughs> I was thinking of a moment that they portrayed in that show where Jesus is standing with his apostle John. And, um, you know, John is saying, well, no one can do the things that you do, you know, or no man can do the things that you do. And he reminds John, I'm a man. Mm. I thought that's, you know, that's that, that moment touched me so much because it was like, you know, we talk a lot about how we're we're supposed to be like Jesus, mm-hmm. but then we also know we're never going to be like him. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in this life, mm-hmm. we're never going to be perfect like he was and like he is still. Um, th- th- there's kind of a paradox right there mm-hmm. that it's like you, you should aim for this and also trust that you're not going to see the fruits of it. Yeah. You know, you're not going to see the full fruits of your labor to be more like Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that takes faith mm-hmm. and that and and at the end of the day even in ter- like i started saying even in the practical terms of i want to understand these two ideas that don't seem to go together mm-hmm. um which is not necessarily like you like you were saying that's not common in philosophy mm-hmm. philosophy has a consistency mm-hmm. it has you know it, it everything's got to make sense mm-hmm. um whereas when something doesn't make sense in scripture and as, a, as, as you're trying to be more like Christ, that's a calling to have faith that you are, you are an image bearer of God. You're capable of understanding his mm-hmm. wisdom, mm-hmm. but you're human. Mm-hmm. And so it's going to be mm-hmm. hard, you know, yeah. it's, and, and I, I like that you brought up that Paul, Paul even calls it, you know, our, uh, the folly we've been teaching, like, mm-hmm. oh, it's going to sound like foolishness oh, because it's, it's often uh, paradoxical. Yeah. And, and I think that's exactly right. And I think, I think even what we mean by understand, like what do we mean yeah. by understand? Like, do, you know, yeah. the the Trinity, the idea that that of the Godhead, the mm-hmm. idea that God is one, but at the same time, God is Father, God is Son, God is Spirit. I understand that. Yeah. Well, do I understand? 
understand that or do I know that? Like, what do you, what do we mean by understand? Like, I believe that this is true. I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that the Father is God. I believe that the Jesus and the Father are distinct from one another. I believe that the Spirit is God, but I believe that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all three distinct from one another, that they are all God, and that there is one God. I, I know all of those things to be true. Why? Because Scripture tells me that these things are true. God tells me that these things are true. This The Spirit has revealed that these things are true. I trust, I believe, I have faith that these things are true, even though to my to my mind, my logic and my natural logic and reasoning, it doesn't make sense. Right. One plus one plus one equals three, not one. Like that doesn't make sense to the natural reasoning, mm-hmm. but it makes perfect sense for spiritual reasoning. It's spiritual understanding. And this is what Paul is distinguishing. He's saying these things are spiritually discerned. And when we're able to trust God, trust God that death equals victory, that the mm-hmm. cross, rather, equals victory, that that y- Jesus hasn't been defeated, that, that Jesus has done the defeating. Somebody said this past week at camp, they said that Satan didn't bury him, he buried Satan. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, yes, I love that. I believe that in the cross, Satan didn't bury Jesus, but that Jesus buried Satan. And, and, how do we understand that? We understand that through the wisdom of the Spirit. We understand that through the wisdom of the gospel, not the wisdom of philosophy. And and this the next point is something you've already brought up. You, you use the word perfect, and and the the Greek word for perfect is telos. It has to do with function and purpose. Like, how do you know something is perfect? Like, if I say this is a perfect book, or that's a perfect cup, or these are perfect keys, or these are perfect. AirPods, you know, if those are perfect. Well, it, this is not a perfect bookmark. I could use it as right. a bookmark, but it's not a perfect bookmark. Yeah. It's not a perfect paperweight. It's a perfect set of AirPods because it does what it's supposed to do well. It does what it's supposed to do perfectly. Mm. It has to, we have to know something's purpose. We have to know why it was made. What is its purpose in order to know whether or not it's good, whether or not it's doing what it's supposed to do. So every philosophy assumes a telos. It assumes a, a, uh, a purpose, a function. And so the, the Epicureans had one idea about the telos, about what, what is our purpose? Why are we here? What are we supposed to be doing? And the Stoics had another idea about their telos, to be virtuous, to live in harmony with nature. Well, we believe that our purpose is to bring glory to our Heavenly Father. We believe that we were designed to glorify God. We believe that we were designed, you mentioned it several times, to be an image bearer of God. That is not naturally discerned. And so every philosophy is utilitarian to some degree. We adopt a philosophy because we say, this is useful to achieving my purposes. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a second. Are they your purposes or are they God's right. purposes? And so if they're your purposes, and that's what most people live by. They, they listen to one YouTuber or another or one philosopher or another, or they read certain books rather than others because they think this person helps me to achieve my goals. Mm-hmm. Well, wait a second. Whose goals are they? If we're just trying to achieve our own goals, there's a problem even in that very base assumption. Um, if, but if we're trying to accomplish God's goals for us, God's purposes for us, then the only way to do that is through Jesus and through walking by the Spirit. And so we have to recognize for every philosophy, there is probably an underlying telos, an underlying purpose, an underlying utilitarian type of philosophy or an assumption that sometimes we don't even recognize. We're not even challenging. And we're saying, wait, now is this philosopher, do they, they're saying, you should do this. You should live this way. You should be this. You should believe these things. You should function this way. Are they trying to accomplish the same things I'm trying to accomplish? Because if they're not, and you adopt their way of living, you, you may end up where they're going, and that right. may not be where you want to end up going. That may That's not be point. what God's intention is for you. So I think we have to be very careful when when somebody says something, and again, every philosophy makes sense, and somebody says, hey, you should live this way, or wouldn't you be happier if you thought this way? Well, wait a second. Mm-hmm. 
is my goal to be happy? Like, is that my goal? Is that my ultimate goal? Is that my ultimate tell us? Wouldn't we all get along better if we did this? Well, wait a second. Is, is it just about getting along better or is it about allowing Jesus to reconcile us and unify us? So I think that that's got to be part of the question here is there's a lot I can agree with with the Stoics, but their underlying purpose for life is not necessarily what mine is. And the last thing, and I know because I know we're running out of time, but I, I think we've got to talk about perception and acceptance that according to Stoic philosophy, or at least as I understand it, that the whole secret to happiness, the secret to being in harmony with nature is just to accept things the way that they are and then to adjust your perception of those things. Mm -hmm. So even, I mean, let's just talk specifically about death. Like, the Stoic philosophy would say, we're all going to die. And we have this tendency to perceive death negatively. So if we just change how we perceive death mm. and we just perceive it positively and just say, that's that's what's going to happen. We're going to die. And so maybe it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And so instead of thinking of it as a bad thing, we'll just learn to think of it as a good thing. And we'll just change our perception. And if we can change our perception, then we can accept it. And we don't have to fight against it. We don't have to worry about it. And so they would say, this is how you're set free from the fear of death. Well, this is problematic for anyone who wants to believe the gospel. But I will say that most Christians function more like Stoics mm. than they do like Christians when it comes to the problem of pain and suffering in the world, that they, we try to put a positive spin on things and to just say, well, we'll just change our perception about it. That's not the gospel. The gospel isn't about happiness being achieved through a change in perception. The gospel is that happiness comes through redemption, that Jesus is going to and is in the process of redeeming things, of right. fixing things, of making the world better, and that we have to be able to admit pain is bad, death is bad, that these are not just a product of a misperception. Well, we just happen to perceive these as bad, but they're really not bad. We just have to change the way that we think about it. We just have to put a positive spin on things like this, and yeah. we just have to learn to think of them in a positive way and learn to accept them. No, the gospel says, I don't accept them. I don't embrace them. I protest them. I lament them. And stoicism leaves no room for lament, for saying, no, this really is bad, and I hate it. And I say, I protest with God, with Jesus, that these things should not be this way. Well, I can think of an example of that, a couple examples of that. Uh, you know, you brought up death. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that one is, is you know, it, it touches you in such a particular way, and it can be, it can be devastating. And, yeah. and you know, when you lose a family member, when you lose someone close to you, and um, but as a Christian, there is a real sense. It's not just changing your perception saying it's a good thing mm -hmm. without anything to back it up. It's like, you know, I, I've, I've even, you know, in the last five, six years or so, you know, lost a couple family members and I've realized, you know, the, the, sometimes those are the moments that your family pulls together, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the best case mm -hmm. scenarios. And sure. obviously sometimes it can go the other way very sadly, but you know, in, in a very real way, a lot of times there's, there's connection, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, you have this thing in common, and mm -hmm. and then on top of that, if you have your faith in common, mm -hmm. then you do have you know you have some things to be thankful for. Mm -hmm. And that was the other example I had that like that's a exercise I try to put myself through more and more is gratitude. Mm -hmm. But it's not just you know, and I know I'm quoting a song here, and I don't mean to do it flippantly, but it's not just count your blessings, mm -hmm. you know, and list them off, and mm -hmm. it's not just that. It's like I, I've had to push myself to be like, no, real gratitude, like really think of mm -hmm. ways that God blessed you mm -hmm. and if there's suffering involved like think about it mm -hmm. and really look and mine it for how has God blessed you mm -hmm. and because the gratitude will absolutely change but I mm -hmm. think to your point about redemption that's perception shifting in the in the structure of redemption. Mm -hmm. It's like percep your perception shifting is because of the redemption. Yes, it's, be it's because of reality. Yeah. It's not just a matter of shifting my perception of things. Mm -hmm. It's about the fact that I'm embracing a new reality, something yeah. that really happened. And so Jesus being raised from the dead 
actually change things, not just my perception of things, but it changes things. Right. It changes reality. And so I think that where where Christianity can help bridge the gap between, you know, just this this total despair of brokenness and and sin and death and all of these horrible things that happen and this this effort to try to just perceive them in a new way, perceive them in a positive way. Look at the the silver lining to things. Uh, Christianity says, no, things really are broken. Things really are bad, but God is able to redeem. God is able to fix what is broken. God is able to help the brokenhearted. And, and we have to, uh, here's a passage just to think about Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. It says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Stoic philosophy says the way to be set free from the fear of death is to perceive it in a different way. Christianity says the way to be freed from the fear of death is to follow Jesus, that Jesus sets you free from the fear of death because he actually sets you free from death. He's going to raise you from the dead so that your dead body is no longer dead. So that he, right, he undoes death for you. He fixes your dead body so it's a live body and it will never die again. It will be immortal and imperishable and undefiable. That this is the new reality because of the resurrection of Jesus. But of course, of course, unbelievers rely on philosophy to help themselves cope with things like death because they have nothing else. Of course, they have to find ways to say, well, let's try to put a positive spin on this. Let's try to look at this through a different lens. Maybe this bad thing really isn't bad. It's just how I'm perceiving it. That's all they have. But Christians have reality. We have God. So it's not the power of perception. It's the power of promise. Christians have the power of promise, not just the power of perception. Stoics only have the power of perception. The only way they can make a bad situation better is by thinking of it differently. The way we make a bad situation better is to remind ourselves of the promises of God. And then we can embrace reality. We can be realists. We can say, this really is bad. This really is horrible. People are not supposed to get old and die. This shouldn't be the way that it is. We can kick against nature. The Stoics said, never kick against nature. If it happened, it was supposed to happen. No, we can say, I protest. I protest. It shouldn't be this way. Neither old people nor young people should die. It shouldn't be this way. And the Bible says, amen and amen. It shouldn't be this way. And one day it won't be this way. Because of the power of Jesus, it won't be this way. So we rely not on the power of perception, but on the power of promise. And I want to see Christians avoid going down this road of saying of just relying on the power of perception to just say well i need to learn to think about this situation differently i need to learn to find the silver lining and like, as you said that's different than finding things for which to be grateful we have a ton of things to be grateful grateful for but mostly we have the promises of god to be grateful for to say i am relying in hope it's hope stoics have no hope a, an unbeliever has no hope the way that it is, is the way that it was supposed to be. The way that it is, is the way that it will always be. But for Christians, the way that it is, is not the way it was supposed to be. And the way that it is, is not the way it will always be. But we are living in this moment, and we're content to live in this moment, not because we've learned a new way to think about reality, but because Jesus has brought a new reality, because we have the promises of God. And so, my encouragement to people is not to rely on the power of perception, but to rely on the pro power of promise. Thank you so much for being part of the Radically Christian Bible Study Podcast today. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode. I want to give a special thanks to Travis Polly and to our McDermott Road Church family for making this podcast possible. As always, we love you, God loves you, and we hope that you have a wonderful day.